Are you ready for the weekend yet? We have events, news, and a guest for you to enjoy this Lake Life weekend. Hello and welcome to another episode of Lake Life Weekend Podcast. My name is Dirk, I'm your host and we are approaching weekend six already. We are off into February and hopefully soon this winter will be over. Um, lean back in our episode today. You can enjoy uh, Missy Hermes from the Historical Society in Audetail County and she will speak a little bit about our history so we thought this is some quiet time uh, grab a cup of coffee a cup of tea enjoy the winter wonderland and learn something about uh, our area and the history uh, behind our township names um, looking forward to March and with lots of cabin fever coming uh, we like to invite you to our expo in downtown Fargo at the Civic Center March 22nd 23rd Go to explorelakelife.com to read up on uh, our program on stage. We have a live program and we have a full expo floor with uh, 45 vendors showcasing um, their products and services from Lakes Country. So a good event coming up in March. Yeah, I um, don't want to keep this much longer from our interview with Missy MS. Go to our daily updated website, lakelifeweekend.com, for events and news from Lakes Country. Have a wonderful weekend ahead. Hello and welcome to our interview part. Back again with uh, Missy Hermes. Hello, Missy. Hello. Yeah, I think um, hopefully everybody remembers Missy from the Historical Society in Audetail County. And we had a Halloween program. We recently had a Christmas program. And uh, she's back again because we want to do a, a series uh, about history in Audetail County and Lakes Country, hopefully, maybe. Um, and in this episode, we will talk about township names, um, how Audetail County was organized maybe, um, right. how it started, and um, I'll give the word um, to Missy. Okay, thank you. Well, and just to explain what a township is, because I didn't grow up with that terminology myself. I grew up in Colorado, okay. and it really wasn't until I moved to Minnesota and lived in a township and participated in township government that I actually knew what that was. So um, townships really were, it's, it's a form of local government in Minnesota and in other places like North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And this is um, something that was established um, in 1787 by Congress. Uh -huh. so, so not we, every state of the United States I, has the township. I don't believe so. <laughs> Interesting. So we um, have a county. For example, in Louisiana, you'll hear talk of parishes, right, and counties. And townships are a smaller um, bite out of a county. So Minnesota, you've got the state of Minnesota, you've got all those counties, and then in each county there's a number of townships. And Ottertill County, the lakes country where we live, um, ha we have 62 different townships. And a township is a square and it has like it's a 36 It's a 36-square-mile unit, right. Right, it's a mile and a mile, and that's a section, and so we have 36, and in the center is always the school. Right. Yeah, Well, <laughs> many in many, yes, uh, the right. school was because part of that. Because is supposed to go. Well, and that's fantastic, too, because um, when a state was being organized, there was certain land that had to be set aside when with the, each, within each um, county and each township. And maybe we can talk about that on another time, but uh -huh. in Ottertail County, um, or in Minnesota, Congress thought that um, it, people would never move here because it was too cold. It was too wild here. Up and from the city, you mean? In uh, Western no, Central? in the con United States Congress oh, in Washington, Washington D.C. They yep. never thought... They thought that in other states, you only had to set aside um, one section, one area in a township, um, one section, as school land. But in Minnesota, it's two sections in each township was set aside as school land because Con United States Congress thought 
that not enough people would ever move here to support the schools because of the cold weather and so on. It was too far north and what have you. And so they thought they better set aside two sections in each township of school land in order to support that. So for shorter distance to get to the school in the winter so they don't... So well, and then the taxes are used to support that, and then um, town, you know, um, counties can sell that la- land too, and states can sell that land to support schools as well. Oh. Just this was um, just decided, I think, last year. There was some town, t- there was some land in Minnesota that was set aside for schools that was um, sold. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. I think so too. Also, in Ottertail County, we're. I just think we live in the most unique area, right? Okay. I, I'm a big cheerleader for Ottertail County, but <laughs> each state also, before it could be, when it was still a territory, before it could be, become a state, you had to find places in your state where there was salt. Really? So there is salt land. So in the 1780s, seven, right, or 1780s, Congress uh-huh. also said. Because there was no refrigeration, that a Pickled, state... so we had to... Yes, in order to preserve meat, meat preserve. and things. Yes, you had to have places where you could find salt. So we have a salt mine? We Minnesota? have, not a mine, but we have salt land in Ottertail County, too. Some of the only places in Minnesota where there is salt are here. Where and they we were live. harvesting salt? Well, you had to have it. You had to prove Yeah, but how did you harvest it? Well, it, it, I think you sain it, or it, there's got to be a way to get it out of the water. There's places in Ottertail County where things really, vegetation doesn't really grow because of the salt. Really? Yeah. I did not know. Is it still in, in no, we don't practice that. No, we, because we don't need, yeah, we yeah, have no. refrigerators. Okay, but okay. someday, if we ever go backwards, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. We have it here where we live. Fascinating. And it's on, you, remember we were talking about maps, and so we'll talk a little bit more about the yeah, township yeah. map, but you can find it on the old plat maps of um, Minnesota and Ottertail County. It'll say salt land. Really? And so yeah. you couldn't, so it was preserved, it was reserved, it was protected. You had to prove that you had salt. You had to find it and say where it was. And so this was mapped. Huh. Yeah. And then you could form... Then you could be a state. state. You had to prove that was one of the things you had to have. each state of the 50 states in the United States, maybe not Hawaii. Up to a certain time, I suppose. Ah. You had to have, of course, Hawaii is surrounded by salt water. Well, I guess, yeah, 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 stupid. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that was clear. (laughs) No, that's okay. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. But that wasn't what I was going to talk about today. No, no. I wanted to talk about townships, yeah. And um, 2018, Ottertail County celebrated its 150th 150. anniversary, mm-hmm. and so I do a history series at the East Ottertail County Historical Museum in Purim, mm-hmm. and so um, so I come once a month for three months, and we thought it might be interesting to give a little of that township history for that history series. Mm-hmm. So. In Ottertail County, we have, and first of all, in Minnesota, there are 1,790 approximately townships throughout the state. 62 of them are in Ottertail County. Mm-hmm. So we have, we're the eighth largest county in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the townships are, because this is lakes, right? Mm-hmm. They have the name of a lake. So Ottertail Township, Rush Lake, um, just looking at our map Marion, here. Maybe. Um, just um, Eagle Lake. So they're based on, those names are based on geographical features of that township, Mm -hmm. especially lakes. Pine Lake to Dead Lake, Star Lake, a lot of them. So Pine Township and Dead Township? No, it's Dead Lake. Oh, so Dead Lake. Lida, like Lida, Mm -hmm. Lake Lida. um, Rush Lake, where Richville is, mm-hmm. et cetera. But then I see Otto. Okay, right. <laughs> and so so the geographical features was one. I really didn't talk about that. That seems self-explanatory. But the other way that I kind of broke it down into three parts was we have a lot of townships that are named for the early pioneers, and many of those were men who had fought in the Civil War. So they were oh. veterans of the American Civil War. Mm-hmm. And then I um, other people... So like Otto, mm-hmm. who is that, right? Yeah, who's and Otto? then um, the also um, there are townships that are named for other places, like Tordenshold. No, mm-hmm. that's a man. I, let's see. I should think of another one. Clitheroe. Clitheroe oh, is a guy too. Oh, Tranium. Tranium oh, Township yeah. is um, 
uh, a place. A so, location. Um, These were all named uh, uh, with the found founding of Minnesota. 150 years ago, uh, all townships? No. Um, what happened is when you wanted, when you uh, were ready to organize your township, you had uh, a township was ready to be organized when 25 of the legal voters in that air, 36 area. mile mm -hmm. square oh, yeah, unit yeah, yeah, yeah. had a meeting, and a majority of those 25 people, well, men, um, would agree on the name of the township and who would be the township officers. So it it uh, it took, you had to have at least 25 people living there. And so we know the years of each township when it was organized. And we know this ah. because there, I used two resources really for my, um, these talks. One was a book called Mason's History of Ottertill County. And John W. Mason wrote this book a two-volume book in 1916. Mm -hmm. He was an attorney that was based in Fergus Falls. He worked for railroads, but he was also a, a private attorney as well. And uh, a, we are beholden to him because he collected the fantastic newspaper collection that we have at the Ottertill County Historical Society. So mm -hmm. he really was interested in history. Um, unfortunately, his history that he wrote back in 1916 is completely riddled with some of his own personal ideas about Native Americans, about women, politics. He didn't think women should vote. And I mean, he, so he, he had a lot of probably uh, typical thinking for 1916 for a powerful white man. Was he an influencer? He was, yeah. Ah, okay. Yep. So he had a voice. He did, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, he definitely did. Okay. Um, but and so he did what? He wrote. Um, oh, those books. This books, mm -hmm. and then the other resource I used is a book called um, Minnesota Place Names, and this also was written in 1920 by a man named Warren Upham, but it's been continually edited and added to over the years as mm -hmm. things change. And so that is published by the Minnesota Historical Society. And when I first started doing these programs, it was online, but they came out with a new edition of their book. It's not online anymore. I think they want to sell their new book. So, mm. yeah. So okay. anyway, that's where I got the information I wanted to mm -hmm. share today. Mm -hmm. um, but and, okay, so you're gonna organize your township. You have 25 men that would meet, typically, at someone's house or business. And I found many times that if it was your house or your business where they were meeting, you might get the township named after yourself, right? Sure, you were the, well, you were the most influential probably too. You were the guest inviting. Right. You were the, probably the, mm -hmm. and you had the word at the meeting probably because mm -hmm. everybody was guests at your house. Interesting, right. interesting. Yeah. And, um, and you maybe had several sons that you could have vote, vote. for to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so 25 men, uh, they could be African American, uh, but not Native American. Mm -hmm. You had to be 21 at that time to vote. Uh, interesting, though, you did not have to own property at that time. That um, property ownership was not a legal requirement for voting in the United States after 1856. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you met, you came up with who were going to be your township officers, and then you um, would present this information and the name you wanted to the county commissioners. Okay, wait a second, township officers, so they... A clerk, and... Oh, really? It's kind of like a mini county. Right. So it's really organized. And it's still that way it's today, like an association, right? condo right. association. Mm-hmm. And really? it's still like that now. You know, so when you have your... In March, oh, sure. every township has we have their... A township hall. Yeah. That's where they meet. Right. I don't just never really remember to vote for them. Well, I don't li I live in the city of Fergus Falls now and so ah, I sure. but I used to go when I lived in Dane Prairie Township, I would go to those township meetings too. Oh, and wait it a was second. Fergus Falls should be part of a township too, no? The city of Fergus Falls has their own city council and mayor. Ah, okay, so that's But there is a Fergus Falls township. I don't live that in oh, there that's anymore. When you live I was of the city annexed. Limit. Yeah. Ah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. I keep interrupting you. No, that's it's okay. That's good. These are good questions. So, um yeah, so after you presented this information to the county commissioners, they could approve or reject the name. Sometimes the name was rejected because another township already had that name, 
or sometimes I don't know why mm. sometimes they just said no no they didn't like you have to pick a different name sure. so anyway Politics. I so I found townships named after Civil War veterans townships named after interesting people and townships that were named after interesting places mm -hmm. and a lot of those are happened to be in Norway uh -huh. that was a common thing in the, the some of the townships ah, in Otter Till County. Mm -hmm. Memories, yeah. Right. So just looking at um, some of our townships. Yeah, where's an interesting story? Like, well, uh, one of who my was a bad boy? Bad, well, bad one boy. of my favorites, um, <laughs> well, you know, you asked about Otto. We yeah. don't really know oh. about Who's Otto? Otto. Yeah, who is that? I mean, <laughs> um, but... We do know about a township named after a man named Gerard. So Gerard Township over by Battle Lake. Mm -hmm. And his and I find this really interesting. How did people know about this guy? His name is Stephen Gerard, and he's the founder of Gerard College in Philadelphia. Uh-huh. Right. And um, he was born in Bordeaux, France. Sure. In 1750. And Stephen Gerard left home when he was only 12 years old, mm -hmm. and his mother died. He left home and became an apprentice officer on a ship at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. And by age 23, he had earned command of his own ship, a brigantine named Sally, and he sailed to New York in 1774. He wow. acquainted himself with the city's merchants and seamen, and he began to import coffee and sugar, which, by the way, we're... Enjoying. Thank yes. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking right now. And he imported this from the West Indies to the colonies while also selling colonial goods abroad. Mm -hmm. And during the Revolutionary War, the British blockade prevented him from returning to New York City. And so he sailed instead to Philadelphia. Sure. And he um, started to live there just as the revolution began. And that same year, he married um, a woman named Mary Lum. And um, later, they would move to New Jersey. And he started to make really, a, he was already, I think, making a fortune. Like you say, he was an entrepreneur. They opened a store, though, and they were starting to provision the Continental Army there in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to his shipping endeavors he sold arms to the South American revolutionaries including Simon Bolivar and when Congress created the first bank of the United States in 1791 Stephen Gerard invested heavily in this new bank so he probably was a contemporary of Alexander Hamilton I'm guessing right wow. mm -hmm. um, by 1811 he was the largest investor in the First Bank of the United States. After Congress failed to renew the bank's charter, Gerard bought the bank and all of its assets, and he became the United States' most powerful banker overnight. Wow. And when the War of 1812 broke out, Gerard lent the United States government $8 million, which I don't know what that would translate into Probably today's money. Or A lot, <laughs> right? He risked his entire fortune to save the United States. He literally kept A the Frenchman. government. Yeah, right. <laughs> he well, and that's well, that's common, right? At that time, right? right, right that right, there, I mean, we could because you have um, uh, Lafayette also. So that that's uh, common. Of course, anything that was anti um, England would have been okay for right, somebody right, right. who was French, right? Um, he literally kept the government solvent until the Treaty of Ghent in 1814, mm -hmm. ended the war. In 1830, at the age of 79, he also was forward-thinking enough to begin investing in railroads. And he guessed that they would be valuable for transporting coal. And, of course, that's something that's still done now, especially around here. Um, in years later. Yeah. In 1998, Almost. Forbes magazine placed Gerard fourth on its all-time list of richest Americans behind only John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and John Jacob Astor. Mm -hmm. Business Insider estimated his peak wealth at $105 billion. Really? Yeah. Um, so he died in 1831, and in his will, he established this Girard College, which was a boarding school for poor white male orphans. And his will spe specifically forbid 
any clergy from teaching at the school. So no priests could be teaching at the school or even entering the campus. No religious, really le this, nothing, no. no priests or anything. He established a 10 foot high wall around the school that would protect students from the world outside. Uh -huh. um, and his relatives contested his will and lost. Their case was argued before the United States Supreme Court in 1844 by Daniel Webster. Um, finally, in 1968, after a very lengthy battle, the United States Supreme Court that students um, could be admitted without regard to race or color. And in 1982, girls were admitted for the first time too. So, so it still exists? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That college. But somehow, at the time that um, so Girard the Township was started, the people living in Ottertail County thought that, I mean, they knew of him. Hmm. I think that's amazing. I mean, and that they named their township after him. Right. And that's proven? Yeah. That they mm -hmm. thought of him? Yeah. They proposed him? Yes. In when? 18 when? Um, when that township? I, you know, I'd have to look it up. Okay. It's but after his death, obviously, and after he founded yeah. the college. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he already had definitely significant, so he was maybe famous throughout the nation. Well, right, Bec especially if people knew that he had saved the country right. during the War of 1812, right? Wow. We don't, I have never heard of him. So no, Stephen isn't that too Gerard bad? I have never heard of him either, but he was amazing. Yeah. I'd never, I mean, I wouldn't have known of him until I looked this up. Hmm. Why is this town named, you know, you think Gerard, that's actually a name. A f first name too. Right. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, Where's the bad guy? That's a good guy. Okay, well, well, I have. <laughs> well, I'll let you decide whether this is a bad guy or oh, a yeah, good guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Butler Township, which is not too far from where we are right now, was organized in 1883, and it was named after Stephen Butler. Stephen Butler is another immigrant um, who was born in England in 1854 in Dorset. And he came to Ottertail County in 1872. And I just, a lot of these stories are young men who are teenagers who are really on their own at a very young age. Hmm. Like that guy, Gerard, didn't he, wasn't he 12, 12 or 14? 14. Okay, so hmm. Stephen Butler is 18. When he arrived here. But that, you know, at that time, 15 is a legal Almost age. Different. Your parents can say you're on your own now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. So he was a legendary lawman who was involved in several of the most notorious crime cases in Ottertail County history. What means lawman? Was he a lawyer? Or he was, was he a, a deputy sheriff. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, oh, okay, but so I know you're still looking for the bad guy, but yeah. the, whether you have to decide whether you think this is good or bad. All right, okay? right. I'm listening. So he is a deputy sheriff, mm -hmm. and he was involved in the apprehension of a young man named John Trivets. And this is a famous case in Ottertail County history. So John Trivets was, um, his family was kind of a family of ne'er-do-wells. His mother ran a boarding house and um, two people were uh, surveyors of the county were staying with the Trivets. And uh, John Trivets, who was a 15-year-old boy, was man. really, really, yeah, a man at the time. Well, mm -hmm. you'll hear what happened mm -hmm. to him, and so we decide. Um, he was really, really fascinated by Jesse James and robbing and killing people. And he decided that he wanted to see what it was like to kill people. And so he knew these two surveyors were going out to do their work um, and he followed them and he murdered them in cold blood and he took their money and their watches. And then he came to Purim and he used some of the money that he had gotten from them in their wallet and he bought himself new clothes and um, bought a train ticket. And so Deputy Sheriff Stephen Butler was the one that tracked him down and apprehended him on the train and brought him back to Purim. Now, the sheriff and the sheriff, the, you know, the sheriff's office and the prison were located in the county seat of Fergus Falls. And so the sheriff 
told Stephen Butler, you need to bring him back here to Fergus Falls. Don't stop in Purim. But he disregarded that. He disregarded it. And um, the people in Purim were absolutely furious that he, this teenager, had killed these two people. And they, I mean, I really, this is where the, it's black and white, right? I mean, is it? Wild, wild west. Yes. So Stephen Butler, if he had brought him to Fergus Falls, but you're not supposed to do that in history, right? Say, if this had happened, this had happened, because we really don't know. But because he, he locked him up in some building here in, in Purim, the people, a mob, broke him out of that, and they lynched him. They hung him right over here um, by the train tracks from a telegraph pole. They killed that. That they did not. He did not get a trial for murder. He was a 15-year-old. Today, we would say that he would belong in a juvenile detention center, even despite the seriousness of his crime. Stephen Butler, I'm sure, knew what was going to happen. He was maybe even allowing it to happen. He was because, you know, I think of the book um, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, and yeah. um, how the, the, the mob tried to break that. And somebody stayed there and kind of talked them down. And I, don't th I think Stephen Butler was respected enough that people in Purim maybe would have backed off a little bit. But he didn't do that. He uh, had it happen. Mm -hmm. So he became a judge. Which he wasn't in the position of. Right. And so that, that boy, who probably would have gone to prison. Sure. And a 15-year-old in prison, in Stillwater at that time, probably would have been, a, it would have been terrible, I'm sure, too. Well, yeah. Now, now we're judging. Well, whatever. Right. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm reading. I mean, I, this could be, I, I really think that. Interesting that's, story. Yeah. Well, that's not the only one, though, that Stephen Butler was involved in. Mm. So they, so. The angry mob lynched the 15-year-old. Okay, the other notorious criminal that Stephen Butler is connected to is another teenager <laughs> named Oliver Curtis Perry. And Oliver Curtis Perry had many aliases, so he was also known as James Curtis Perry and um, Oliver Moore and also the alias Kurt Perry. And um, Oliver Curtis Perry first came to public notice in 1880. He was a very young man, and um, I'm, I'm not sure, he was, he was maybe 14, 15 years old again, and he was sent from back east to live here in Otters Hill County with his uncle. His uncle's name was Barney Griffith, and Barney Griffith was an early pioneer merchant in Frazee. So he had a store in Frazee, and Oliver was working for his uncle. Uh, but he, I, he must. He decided he would rob his uncle, Barney. Um, so his uncle was out collecting money from some of his patrons. Remember, a lot of people back in those days were able to buy on credit. And mm -hmm, then when their crop mm -hmm. was sold, then they would be, be able to pay back the storekeepers that they had borrowed mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Oliver was waiting for his uncle to come back from um, collecting money. He was going to kill his uncle and take the money he had collected. But his uncle returned with someone else. It wasn't just him by himself. There was two of them. And so Oliver gave up the plan. But shortly after that, he set fire to his uncle's store. Mr. Griffith, his uncle, swore out a warrant for his arrest. And it just so happened that Oliver Perry was here in Purim at that time. And Mr. Butler, the deputy sheriff, arrested him while he was weighing himself at the mill, he was, uh, I'm not sure why he was doing that. Anyway, um, Oliver Perry was convicted on the charge of burning the store, so arson, and was given three years at Stillwater Prison. So we could have asked him what was it like for a teenager down mm -hmm. at Stillwater. Okay, so after he got out of Stillwater, after three years, he swore that he was going to come back and kill his uncle and Mr. Butler, Deputy Sheriff Butler. Um, Revenge. Yes. But he changed his mind. And instead of killing them, he went out to Montana and killed someone out there. Why not? Yeah. Just go somewhere else. <laughs> the next time he was heard from, he was wounded and captured for robbing a railroad, a train, the New York Central. And this is the first time... How did he get away with the murder in Montana? I, I don't know. Oh. 
And maybe he escaped. I don't know how. Oh. I don't know what happened between the murdering someone in Montana. Maybe he just was able to get away. And then he was in New York? Yeah. And he was the first American. Uh, this is the first time in American history that a person robbed a train solo by themselves. They didn't have like a gang like you see on TV. movies. Right. Yeah. Um, he was sentenced to 49 years in prison for that train robbery. And maybe they added on this other thing, this okay. killing this guy in Montana. I don't know. Um, and it is suppo- and uh, this prison that he was sent to is the Donna Mora Prison Hospital. And that, ho- that prison has been in the news a lot lately. Do you w- ever watch HBO? I don't there know is TV. a there is a series on HBO right now that is being produced by Ben Stiller yeah. about two men who um, two prisoners who escaped from the Donna Mora prison in New York, right? Um, with the help of a woman who worked there uh-huh. at the prison. Um, but Oliver Perry was at this prison because um, he it, it's a prison for the criminally insane, or it was at that time, which would, I think in Minnesota, that's St. Peter, people that have committed some real serious crimes. But anyway, the reason they think he really developed this mental illness, although he already had some tendencies, right, of violence and so on, but that he was kept in solitary confinement a lot. And we know this is true. And there are people, um, you know, studies have been done about the the severe um mental anguish of being kept by yourself for a long time so what he did is um he was wanted they were making you work him work in the the prison he refused to do it and he said he refused to do it because of conditions in the prison and rather than work oliver perry blinded himself with a piece of sharp metal yeah so he Obviously, things were going on there. Mr. Butler kept track of him the whole time he was in prison. Um, in 1895, Oliver Perry escaped from that um, hospital but was reapprehended. Yeah, I, I think that must have been be after, before he blinded himself. I was going to say. Yeah, there's actually a folk song named after him called The Fate of Oliver Curtis Perry, and I looked it up on YouTube. You can listen to people singing really? yeah and there's also a winery in new york state the thorpe vineyard that has created a white wine name for him insane oliver curtis perry white wine mm-hmm. yeah well, maybe they don't know the full story maybe they don't <laughs> i'm not sure i want to drink that no. anyway that is stephen butler but uh-huh. his story is so fantastic because we know about him living in england we know about how he courted his bride here in Purim, who she was, um, and, uh, but, but just, uh, he was just the, the fact that he was involved with those two. He must have been a hero to the people. He was. Yeah. Yeah. he was the... A lawman, like you say, the wild, man. wild west. It was... Yeah, but he must have had supporters. He was an influencer. He sold the good or the law. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Is there uh, more individuals? Well, or like what is there like an you said uh, well, places in Norway? I wanted to talk Norway? about a little, yeah, but I also um, have um, again talking about um, we have three or four, we have four townships in Otter Till County that are named for women, uh huh. And so I thought I'd tell you about one of those. Um, we have Elizabeth Township, uh huh, and that's um, named for a woman named Elizabeth, obviously, yeah. and then we also have. Three contiguous townships, Lida, yeah. Dora, and Edna. Uh-huh. And this is what John Mason, who I told you had kind of um, was against women being able to vote. This is what he the said. First Falls gentleman? Yes. Right, right, right. This is what he said about townships named after women. Mm-hmm. Long before women's suffrage became the issue it is today, there was a mania for naming townships in Otter Till County after women. How many romances are behind such names as Elizabeth, Lida, Dora, and Edna will probably never be known. But it is a safe conjecture that the fine hand of some woman is responsible for these feminine name townships. There's four. I'm not sure that's a mania when you've only you've got 62 townships to name. Yeah, that's... Uh... 
It's kind of a stinker. But I want to tell you about Dora because I feel like she deserves to have a township named after her. If I was going to pick one woman, I would definitely pick Dora. Who is Dora? So she is really, her real name is Isadora Sedalia Woodruff Thomas. Mm -hmm. And um, her township was organized in 1879. She and her husband, um, Ellis, were the first settlers in that township. And although Ellis, the husband, was born in Pennsylvania, Dora was from Indiana. She was born in 1856. So when the township was being named for her, she was a young woman still, 23 years old. Um, The couple married in 1875. So, boy, she was only a youngster, 19. Mm -hmm. And they were living in Carver County, Minnesota. And then Ed Ellis, the husband, came up here to find a homestead. So... Okay. Mapping out his 160 acres, right? Mm-hmm. And then he went back to Carver County and collected his wife, and they had a little daughter by that time named Rachel. Mm-hmm. Dora eventually had 16 children all together. Oh. See, I believe that, that you should have a township named after you. 16 children. And they raised them in a little log cabin. Yeah, by Loon Lake. Really? Yeah. By Vergus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's Dora. So Dora. Yeah. Right. Um, huh. the, they survived at first by fishing and hunting. Really? That's how, that's how they fed their family themselves, by fishing and hunting. Ellis also did what a lot of early pioneers, especially around this area, he was a timber cruiser. So they would farm, improve their land, right? Cutting down trees, building, and so on in the summer months. And then in the wintertime, they would go and work for a lumber company, the mm-hmm. lumber industry. Mm-hmm. Or a timber cruiser, I think, is someone that's actually floating, floating the logs. Oh, sure, you know? down the stream. Mm-hmm. Yep. And when he did that, Dora was left home with the children for weeks at a time. So she's taking care of the garden, children, animals, all those things. Wow. Um, This couple also operated the first post office at Spirit Lake, which is in that township. And they sold supplies to the people who were traveling between Frazee and Pelican Rapids, um, mainly Native American people, as well as trappers and hunters. In addition to that, they had a fruit orchard and they sold produce. And despite that, Ellis, um, Dora outlived Ellis by 11 years. He died in 1936 and Dora died in 1947. 1947? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. She almost got 100 years old? Right. It's amazing, isn't it? I just, I think, I don't know. Why would you, John Mason, why would you uh, be against... So she was the name giver to that well, when she was I think so pe- young, remember she the twenty five voters or had to a majority had to agree, and so right. so tw- uh, you know people I think these men recognized her accomplishments too. Um, hmm. It's the same with Elizabeth. Um, they didn't name Elizabeth after her husband; they named it after her, his uh, partner, really, hmm. right? I mean, because somebody is having to take care of all these kids. And the garden and so on while he's um, working for a lumber company. Hmm. All right. Okay, so some township names. What are they named after? Well, Osted Township, which is close to Fergus Falls, right, mm, no, no. Um, is named at, was organized in 1871. And um, not surprisingly, every single one of the legal voters at that ver- very first meeting were Norwegians. Mm-hmm. And we know their names, Severson, mm-hmm. Bow, Brocky, Ellingbo, and Hostad. So, Osted Township is named after a borough in the city of Bergen, um, Norway. Mm-hmm. And historically, the area um, was a separate municipality until uh, called Ostad until 1916. But um, there's still quite a link um, between the Ostad and Bergen and... Um, Fergus Falls, that community that um, Osta Township is near, and that's um, because Hillcrest Lutheran Academy, which is located in Fergus Falls, 
Um, each year ho hosts close to two dozen high school students from the Danielson School, which is in Bergen. Oh, really? And so the and um, I think um, there there's a sister city. Oh wow. Um, com, you know relationship between right. Fergus Falls as well. And um, the Lutheran Brethren Seminary in Fergus Falls and several churches in the area have a historical connection with Bergen as well. Um, but during the Viking Age, the King of Norway um, is believed to have had an, an estate there. At times, it was um, the home, the farm was the home of King Harald Fairhair and his son, King Eric, Eric Blood Axe. In, in Bergen, though. Right. Not here. <laughs> no, not here. Right. <laughs> um, Let's see. So um, I just that's kind of just an aside about that place. Also, Effington Township, which is closer to Parker's Prairie, and was organized in 1872, is named after a fictional location. Uh -huh. One of the township residents had read a novel, and in the novel was a town called Effington, and he was so taken with that name, he thought it sounded so beautiful that he suggested this name. Um, this is from Mason's history. When the first township meeting was held in 1872, the voters could not agree on their new baby's name. He's kind of a sarcastic guy sometimes. Um, the majority wanted it to be christened after its first settler or its mother. Um, and so um, Mrs. Anna C. So names like Anna and Anaheim were um, proposed. Um, this was vigorously opposed by someone else who wanted to name the town or the township Arlington, um, which is the name of a place where he had lived before. But Matt Evans had literary tastes and had even read a novel. And in this novel had occurred the name of Effington. And Matt Evans thought it was the most beautiful name he had ever heard. And um, so um, he won. He got, and I saw so I was looking up, I wonder where is Effington or are there any Effingtons today? And I found that there's actually a book now that was published in 2015 um, about a zombie apocalypse. And there is an Effington that is in that book. That's where um, the zombie apocalypse, I guess, <laughs> takes place. That's, Effington. Oh, uh, funny. Um, one other, Tronium Township which is where Ratze is located, was organized in 1873. And that's a Norwegian name also that translates to throne home. And it's an ancient city in Norway on the south side of the Trondheim Fjord. And it was the burial place of early Norwegian kings and later the site where kings were crowned. Mm. So I, I, I find that interesting that the Norwegian settlers were picking... You know, they were uh, picking up on that heritage right. of their home, that they were picking that, those mm, names yeah, um, with celebrate them. Celebrate their history and right. bring it here. And mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I Be agree, yeah. yeah. Very interesting facts. Um, uh, 62 townships, um, eighth largest county, uh, a little bit of female influence. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> There's even a there's a German township too. Oh, there is. Which one? Yes, would that be? it's Freiburg. Freiburg. Yes. Mm, Freetown. Right. No, Free Free Castle. And Freiburg. it is, uh, loc Well, of course oh, they they've spelled it, it differently. They took the <laughs> e out, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well. Oh, yeah. Freiburg. Well, there is a Freiburg. In Saxony. Yeah, but yeah. Anyways, th that's that means mountain, but right, okay. Free Mountain. That's what yeah. it's named mm -hmm. after, and it's the third largest city. Mm -hmm. In Saxony, only Dresden and Leipzig are larger. Oh yeah, Freiburg. Okay, now I know. Nicht Freiburg. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has a population now of 40,000 people. The Technical University, the mm -hmm. world's oldest school of mining, mm -hmm. is located there. So silver mining was a long tradition there. The first silver ore discovered there in 1168 AD. And by the 16th century, mining in the Ore Mountains, so Erzgebirge. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, had turned that t area into the, one of Europe's wealthiest kingdoms. Interesting. The township was organized in 1874, and it was first called Florence, and that was changed to Woodland, and finally it was called Freiburg. And it is the location, I mean, uh, one of the, it, the famous residents of Freiburg Township is a man named Herbert Krauss, 
who grew up in this uh, very tight German Lutheran township, very um, conservative community. Um, he went on to teach at South Dakota State University and he founded the Center for Western Plains Study there in South Dakota. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Interesting. So. Erzgebirge, that's uh, where um, all the cuckoo-cuckoo-slogs come from. Oh. And all the German uh, wood-carved uh, Christmas decorations. Okay. So I was wondering if there's any with the woodwork or that would have been fun too if we had. It's mainly a farming area. Mm. Yep. Anyways, yeah. But there's our one German. Uh, one oh. out of 62. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like the women for <laughs> <Right>. us. <laughs> very... Very minority, unfortunately, but right. that's okay. Yeah, no, that is a, a beautiful um, uh, insight and um, story um, telling here from our historical background or history. Right. Maybe if somebody's listening and actually can email us at hello at lakelifeweekend.com and if they want to learn about something particular in our county uh, um, or maybe um, a city, a town, I, I don't know, uh, hear a story. They can email us and uh, ask Missy. Yeah? That would right? be great, wouldn't it? That would be cool. It? Yeah. Yeah, so please uh, um, email us, hello at lakelifeweekend.com, and we can maybe make a program tailored uh, for your inquiry. Well, I, I, I thank you very much for coming out again, and uh, we will do this uh, more often to um, uh, learn and s- and keep the traditions of uh, Lakes Country uh, OTC, Auditor County. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this was already our uh, newest episode of the Lake Life Weekend podcast. We sure hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Tune in again next week with another great guest and updates. Always check out our website, uh, lakelifeweekend.com. And if you have some comments, please feel free to email us at hello at lakelifeweekend.com. And uh, you have a wonderful weekend ahead. Uh